Hello Facebook Live and Pink and Facebook page followers. We are here at South Mim Services on a Saturday afternoon. We are still heading back from Cardiff. No rest for the wicked. And I guess we probably did all did something quite bad to uh, get what we got on, fr on Friday. But there we go. Uh, David Freezer and Paddy David, of course, with me here uh, to give a bit of the uh, fallout and reaction from uh, Norwich City's Friday night defeat at Cardiff. 3-1, the Canaries went down. Lots of issues to discuss and lots of subsequent reaction too, which we're all uh, perfectly well aware of too. So I've given my video verdict on, uh, on the YouTube page and, and on Facebook. Gents, shall we have a, a bit from you? Pad, do you want to kick it off? Um, your immediate thoughts swirling around your mind after uh, last night? More of the same, mate. I don't want to sound wise after the event, but I think on the pre-match Facebook I said it had a feel of Millwall to me in terms of what he was saying he was going to get, physicality, very good on set pieces, balls into their box. How are we going to counteract it? We have these wonderful technical midfield players who can dominate possession, keep the ball quote. Far. I might be paraphrasing. <laughs> Not that I'm hacked off at all, but um, having, having had to watch that again. But uh, it was, it was Millwall, not in the scale of the defeat, but in the ease with which they folded. Um, let's, let's be honest, Cardiff weren't at the races first half. I don't think it, it was Norwich was super, super, super good. Um, they were decent, but I think Cardiff were very poor, acknowledged by uh, Warnock with two substitutions attacking wise at half time within three minutes. Their level, and then there was only one result from there. Um, bit pig sick of it now to be honest it's um, it's not enough just written something there uh, for Monday's papers it's not enough for me to talk about injuries or you know uh, medium to long term projects or you know even the finances we, we know all that they're, they're all factors that's all mitigation but you know seven games without a win in the league not scored two goals in a game since Reading and that's the only time since August Car Road, we all know what's happening there, not a great deal. Then you drill down into the team. What is Nelson Oliveira offering at the minute? What is Steeperman offering? Is he a left back? Don't think he is. The goals they're conceding, very similar. Near post striker runs across the centre back. The lack of protection from the central midfield, too. It just on and on. It's just a complete mess at the minute. And, uh, and I'm not overly buying into Farka going on the route that it was all down to the referee and he had nothing to reproach his lads about he's got plenty to reproach his lads about and he needs to sort it out as well and quickly yeah and just before I come to you Dave I mean a lot was made of the penalty incident and, and this and that and the, how poor the decision was yet you flip it around they actually put the, he the ball in the net from Sol Bamber anyway so ultimately the whole argument is completely flawed in terms of if they hadn't have given a penalty it would have scored anyway it was literally in the net yeah, agreed. Sorry, I thought you thought you get there, Dave. I'll just calm me down a bit. We'll give, we'll give you, we'll give Pat a couple of seconds. Deep uh, go on, Dave. Give it, give us well your view on that and, and and overall. Yeah, they can't complain too much about that. Um, I, I said to Pat at half time, "There's no way Cardiff are going to play as badly as they had in the first half after the break." You knew that Warnock would give him a rocket. He did. Made the changes which changed the game and. Yeah, it's it's beyond worrying now. You know, seven games without a win in the championship, two difficult games coming up: Sheffield Wednesday at home and Leeds away. So things aren't looking good, and the team just does not look solid enough. As Pad has mentioned, there you've got the the technical players, and they're trying to play nice football, but it's not even that nice football, to be honest. For considering they're going in that direction, but. Um, yeah, with Wes and Matt, I mean, Madison does look like he needs a rest now. Um, and it looks like it, he could easily be given one as well, really, when you've got Pritchard back, Wes playing. Wes was good first half last night and he, he faded, but you can't have Wes chasing back, trying to protect your penalty box as well as try and create further at the field. That's just not his game. It never has been, is it? So, um, I mean, I thought Harrison Reed worked tirelessly last night. I thought it was really tenacious performance but he was just trying to put out fires all over the shop and you can't have one person doing that when you go to Cardiff he was second in the league they got Neil Warnock in charge they put their foot on the pedal in the second half and they just got overwhelmed again and we're seeing it too often in the championship so they need to find a way to get back to basics in midfield as a starting point and 
I've seen a lot of comments after the game. You know, there's not enough passion. They're not wor working hard. They, they don't want it enough. Those sort of cliched things. And I, I don't think that's true. I mean, Nelson Oliveira was poor last night, but I don't think he's not trying. I think he's trying too hard, if anything. And some of his shots are ridiculous. Uh, uh, there was one bang in front of us in the press box, wasn't there? And as soon as he hit it, I burst out laughing because I was like, well, "What the hell was that? It was miles wide." And so I, I don't think that's the sign of a player who's not trying. I just think they need, to, they desperately needed some guidance, and I, it, it feels at the moment like they're just, it's just not a happy camp. It's funny you say that because Pad, the word you mentioned in the journey was rudderless, which is a strong word. Well, what other conclusion you can, can you draw? This isn't a blip now. Not seven games without a win in the championship is not a blip. You know that's that's a slump for me, I'm afraid. Um, and we need to obviously retain a degree of perspective about it. And there are factors at, at risk of repeating myself. You know, Alex Tete, he would he would offer to take Dave's point about central midfield. He he would offer a huge amount. I think alongside Tom Tribal, you know, that we all saw what them two could do, and that was the anchor for for that extended run of decent results. But you know, it's just it's a major concern now that. It's week after week, and and okay, they can put forty five minutes together. Again, maybe allied to Cardiff not being at the races, but when are we going to see a ninety minute performance with a few goals and defensively sound? I, I think seven games into this type of run, you need to ask some serious questions of the head coach and and those players. It's too easy for me to hide behind refereeing decisions. Um, the referee hasn't been at fault for the last seven games, so a bit of bit of responsibility, a bit of introspection is what I want to see now and uh, you know I mean it doesn't get any easier now we'll, we'll throw it forward in a bit I'm sure but Sheffield Wednesday home leads away conceivably this could be nine games without a win and then you're into a really pivotal run and uh, you know complete for me you can forget you can forget about any talk of promotion now not that it was a great deal after after the state of this run I mean it's that's that's a long way way gone um, it's really about consolidation in this phase of the season and not getting sucked the other way because it, could you see that group of players going and, and grinding out results I can't at the minute I don't think there's enough fight in that group of players um, you know it's this kind of the philosophical way that he wants to play clearly isn't suited to the state of what they find themselves in at the minute have they got enough players and a head coach who can develop a template which is going to go to a Cardiff and dig in because you're going to be under pressure home or away that's the championship you're going to come under pressure and the frustration I think for me is that they went to Middlesbrough and they were under intense pressure Reading at times Sheffield United probably the most intimidating 90 minutes they've faced and magnificently resolute came through it why can that group of players produce those levels of performance and now we see in this it, the fluctuations in levels of consistency are uh, just too marked Fark has talked about you get that with young players as opposed to he talks a lot now about waves and rather than a, a, a more level horizontal seam of consistency that you get with experienced players but that's just too easy for me just too easy you know th th these are young players who are getting a lot of exposure to first team football now we need to see more we need to see more individually and collectively and uh you know, as I say, if, if we don't start seeing it soon, then I'm, I'm afraid uh, it's going to be a very, very long season. We're all well aware of the pressure that Daniel Farker is coming under, um, even even so early in, in his reign, given the run that they've had. That there was a, a reason that they were always slipping behind, which was kind of the issue, but they've actually been ahead in three of the last four games, I think, isn't it, off the top of my head? Yeah. Um, recently we were saying, oh, if Norwich can just get the yeah, lead, they'll be that. fine. <laughs> and, and, you know, last night, a, a, a big case in point. Um, get your questions in on the Facebook feed. They're, they're coming through on my phone. I'm not being rude. I'm looking through, through them all. Um, and, you know, it's quite clear some of the, the, the pressure is coming from all angles, really. So, um, Owen Bell, uh, it's not down to Farker and the players, it's down to the board and the owners. If we had an owner and a board that actually wanted the club to go somewhere, we would be doing a lot better. There is no ambition from the board and the board are coming up with excuses. Uh, Jason McDonald, Farker is the full guy. Weber is equally to blame. Who set up, our whole setup stinks and change needs to come at the top. Uh, Barry Dale, surely Weber must take some of the stick. He bought the players that are not good enough for the rigours of the championship. Younger, hungrier players from the lower leagues would perform 
better. And you know, at this point, everyone is coming under a, a lot of a lot of scrutiny. Well, yeah, it's hot on the heels with the AGM, isn't it? And I think one of the, the comments, you, you know, for all, all the theory that Stuart Webber lays out there, and you know, he's a good talker and a very affable guy. And I think one of the quotes he used in one of his interviews after the AGM was, um, you know, that. 100% they are doing the right thing medium to long term. I mean, that's all well and good and that may prove to be the case, but you can't say that's 100% of this case, uh, at this moment in time because it's going to presumably take months, if not years, before we know the actual answer to that. But it feels like the short term has kind of been a bit forgotten about and, and Daniel Farkas is not, at the moment, able to, to get a tune out of the squad that he's he's got. I mean... It, for me, it all comes down to the midfield at the moment. I, I just don't know what the answer is. I, I, I said in our team news before the game last night that I didn't really want Mario Vrancic playing, and he was fine last night. He did. A, he had a few good moments. It wasn't his worst performance, but there's just not enough physicality there from the bloke, is there? And that's that's the only way I can see them stemming the tide, and is by sorting out that midfield. But we don't even know if Alex Tetti's going to be back. Um, in training yet this week, do we? So um, it sounds like it'll be after Sheffield Wednesday. I mean, Edward Ivans asks: Do people understand that we have lost many key players, and the injury list is getting longer? Alex Tetty is key to all this, which is fine. And I think you look at the actual statistics: Alex Tetty is key. He's also a player that's out of contract in the summer and is is not going to be signing any deal that will keep him around the club and you know there has to be something more substantial than relying on Alex Tetty at the moment well and he's also a player who was not even in Farkas plans between the start of the season and Millwall I remember the quote I've sat Alex down he's a really great professional but I've told him at this moment in time Harrison Reed is the way I want to go which flows into the identity and the method of play that Farker wanted which was clearly not fit for purpose and it's to Farker's eternal credit that at that point he was pragmatic enough to admit, OK, maybe I've got this slightly wrong. Bring, brings Tetty back in. He changes the system, goes to 4 2 3 one, gives him a bit more protection to that back four. And look at the trigger. Look at, look, at the, look at the outcome. So what I want to see now, irrespective of whether Alex Tetty's fit or not, I want to see that pragmatism again and, and to reinvent it again because it's just so predictable at the minute. And if it's predictable for us... We're not inside the game, you know. We can't claim to be football experts in that sense. How predictable is it for a Neil Warnock or, or oppositions to work Norwich out? They know full well they can power through the midfield as it stands at the minute, and then attack a vulnerable backline. And uh, and conversely, when Norwich do attack at the other end, there's a striker there who couldn't hit a barn door. So, you know, it's not that difficult to deconstruct Norwich at the minute. So Farker needs to lock himself away with his coaches for a few days at Colney and come up with a new way of, of, of operating um, he's done it once before so that tells me he could do it again because fundamentally the results in the last seven games tell you what they're doing isn't sufficient and how do you tra- how you change that trend isn't for me by continuing to do the same thing it's the old adage isn't it you keep banging your head against the brick wall you stop eventually because it hurts your head You'd like to think so, anyway. Or you knock yourself out. Uh, Joe Meads, most annoying thing is we were promised this German style of play with the high press, scoring goals, and it just hasn't materialised at all. I'm prepared to give Farker time, but patience is wearing thin, which, again, we're all perfectly aware of. No one ever promised that. That that, that was all what we expected because of what had happened with Stuart Webber and David Wagner at Huddersfield. When Daniel Farker turned up, he said, I'm more like Pep Guardiola and Thomas Tuchel. He told us it was going to be a more possession-based style. He never said, we're going to be about high-pressing. But the, Norwich aren't good enough in possession. I mean, not, as we said, they're not doing what Daniel Farker wants them to do well enough. So, again, that's the pragmatism, isn't it? But, you know, is that, is that the head coach asking too much of them? Are the players actually capable of it? Because we would sit here and think, well, James Madison, um, you know whoever they're all where's Hulahan they should be awesome excellent in possession they should be able to do that well ultimately again you go back to that block of 10 games more often than not it was basically counter-attacking rear guard action soaking up pressure and then being really clinical and really efficient because they wasn't creating loads of chances in that run but when they did you think of Ipswich there's the perfect example they were under the cosh for spells nice little counter-attack Madison edge of the box beautiful finish and then they sort of came out with very few alarms in that 10-game run, they wasn't barcelona or Man city teams off the park and dominating the ball and being brilliant with progressive passing and quick passing. We spoke about this last night. Even the way that he wants to go, they're either not good enough or they're incapable of doing it. So abandon that and let's come up with something a bit more pragmatic because 
ultimately, you know, at the risk of repeating myself, where is the next win coming from? I mean, to look at a positive from last night, it was a good goal, oh, wasn't oh, it? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> um, Steveman, good finish, and they deserve to be in front at half time. Cardiff, like, like we've said, weren't great. Um, but that's now three times in 20 league games when they've scored more than one goal. I mean, one of, one of those occasions was in a 4 2 defeat at Villa. That's just unacceptable. I mean, it's so Norwich City, isn't it? Last season, joint top scorers in the whole league. This season, can't manage to score more than one goal in a game. I mean, they scored six goals in one half in April yeah. against Reading. <laughs> how, how how many games have we got since there've been a six, since six goals have been scored? It must stretch back what pretty much this run of uh, yeah. no wins. It's um, ridiculous. Sonny Stewart Winter, bad results equals lack of confidence, equals bad run. Things will turn around eventually. However, we've no chance of getting promoted this season, which means probably losing our quality players next season. We need a new injection of funding, new investors, or we'll be struggling championship club or worse for years to come. And there was a, a, another message. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, about. <laughs> played, played alongside me at North Horsham Football Club. Uh, under 10s so. is, that, is that what we're judging it on is it? oh yeah big oh, okay. time that's right. where well, the real knowledge is <laughs> that's alright then and uh, Keith Baker it doesn't matter what coaching uh, coach slash manager we have it's always the same thing over the last few seasons it goes down to the board and owners having no ambition with the club and no ideas of their own and tried to copy what other clubs do uh, to me that's absolving Farker I'm sorry I can't have that because if it didn't matter about the coaches what did Alex Neil do in that first six months that was completely down to him that wasn't down to the players because the same players were the ones he inherited wasn't down to the board, only in the sense that they appointed him or David McNally appointed him. That was a manager who came in and galvanised a group of players and got them all on side and then got them winning games in adversity when they were on top, culminating at Wembley. The, you, you cannot overlook that Farke isn't, for my mind, he isn't stepping up to the mark at the minute. Um, and as I say, there's a lot of mitigating factors and nobody disputes that. And yes, there are issues that we can get into about the board, investment and new ownership. But for me, in this seven-game run, it's the same head coach, same coaching team and essentially the same players, bar one or two injuries, that went ten unbeaten. So how can they now go seven without a win? And, and Paul Lambert, uh, harking back as well, is someone, they did nothing different. It was just the recruitment and how he, as you said also, galvanised that squad and took them straight through the division, you know. It's the coach can have such a difference even if you've got no money and you can see that from a lot of other clubs thought, as well I thought at the end it was quite telling when you've got Farker and Closer having almost an argument probably not an argument but more a heated discussion about what had, what had gone on I thought that was quite unusual to let them to, to allow that to happen on the pitch in front of everyone rather than in the dressing room and that maybe just showed that the frustration is boiling over in that dressing room and that they are searching for the answers and they don't really know what the answer is uh, uh, fair, fair play no one give Harrison Reed for a stick for speaking to us last night because um, not everyone wanted to so that was part of the reason why he was um, stood in front of us uh, Edward Ivans we need some somebody to break up attacks David Platten you can answer this one very briefly boys if you want would you bring Godfrey back Lard as an athlete could play in the defensive midfield role well 100% because because if Tete's not fit they've got nobody else in that role I mean you've t- spoken about it at length with Reed. he doesn't have there's many good things about Harrison Reed as a footballer, but he doesn't. He, he's not a defensively minded midfielder. He doesn't sense danger. He doesn't get himself in the right positions he needs to be. He doesn't anticipate where the ball could break down. Um, Tete does have that ability, and I think Godfrey potentially would have that ability. So that's a massive area of the squad that they're so deficient in that area, and, and, and it's no coincidence that without Tete in the side, they look so vulnerable. Yes clone him they need to clone him clone him that's drastic uh, Neville Townsend he says he's really looking forward to Leeds away got Sheffield Wednesday at home before that Neville um, Jason McDonald should we have appointed Farker or given Irvin a long term contract I mean we're, we're obviously going over quite a few uh, big old ground bits I mean Alan's busy with uh, the fun and games of West Ham at the moment so that ship sailed isn't it I don't, I'm pretty sure that if you offered Alan the job in two weeks time he'd turn it down because he'd say it's not a squad I want to take on now uh, Craig Brown's listing them all here. Yes, well, of course, we don't have Jacob Murphy and Housen, who scored a lot of those midfield goals. Both have not been replaced properly. Never replaced Gary O'Neill when he left. Never replaced Graham Dorans. Tribal and Reed poor signings. I mean, it's not so much they haven't been replaced, I guess, Craig. It's that, and again, this all came up at the AGM. They've had to slash what they're spending on wages and, and the payers they're bringing in are, you know, new to it. 
Thus. Are they good? Are they good enough? That's the question we're trying to figure out now. I mean, it's difficult because obviously, you know, if we'd had this, um, and I'm sure we did do Facebook Live after uh, the Ipswich game, then Tom Tribal was the best thing since sliced bread. Um, et al. Um, so it's difficult to put a marker down at any given point in the season when the results, as they are at the minute, are so up and down. I guess we'll only really be able to answer that probably definitively come the end of the season when the dust settles. But you know, to go back to the Alan Irving point, he wouldn't have had this squad of players because the finances dictated that John Ruddy had to go, uh, uh, Ryan Bennett, and, and all those lads. We've seen the figures. You know, last week at the AGM, they saved themselves 170,000 a week collective wage by offloading those lads and bringing in guys on much more reduced salaries. So, you know, to me, it's not really about should they've given Alan Irving a go or not. It's 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 the reality the reality is they've got this squad of players I've said it all along I mean it was brave it's, it's a brave move to go down this route rather than go I mean you see what's happening in the Premier League at the minute it's just a merry-go-round of uh, octogenarian managers <laughs> or septuagenarian maybe I'm putting a few <laughs> putting a few years on Halladice et al but it's just how they look yeah but it's kind of yeah but and, and to, to basically break out in the way they've done is brave and it's commendable and it may to, to go back to the medium and long term it may pay dividends but right here right now it's it's hard to see anything that resembles a work in progress on the pitch which is ultimately where they're judged I think Weber said it at the AGM you know it's results on the pitch you know they can be doing all the structural changes and personnel changes they want to that academy but ultimately they will be measured by the vast majority of fans certainly by the media by what's happening on the park every 90 minutes and on that measure over these seven games they're well short Following on to that as well, I didn't bring it up before the game, but um, I remember when Stuart Webber arrived in his press conference, he uh, flippantly joked, I won't be appointing Neil Warnock or anything to keep us up, which I doubt reached Neil's ears, otherwise I'm sure he would have brought it up. But um, yeah, Warnock's, uh, Warnock knows the championship, doesn't he? And that's the thing with Allardyce in, in the Premier League. They know what they're doing. And Farker is learning these things week by week. Doesn't you know? He's coming up against players that he's probably never heard of until he started doing his homework on the game. So it's inevitable that he's not going to get everything right. Um, but if he doesn't start getting more things right than he is at the moment, then I mean, I, I thought there was no way that we could be talking about Farker's future this season. And probably you speak to the club's hierarchy, and there still is no chance of that being a ris- uh, being at risk. But you know, you lose Sheffield Wednesday and, and Leeds. If somehow they don't beat Brentford three days before Christmas at Carrow Road, and they extend that awful home record to what that would be nine games there's going to be real ructions people are really not going to be happy and I'm, I'm not sure what the way forward would be from there it's I, I do just worry that he's maybe underestimating it that's my, my problem with with, uh, with Daniel Farquhar in the championship at times uh, Simon Meadows I'm not a negative supporter but we seem to be en route to getting drawn into the relegation zone at an alarming rate in relation to results I've kind of had a niggle in the back of my mind that you know you don't want them get I, I've seen Norwich in their shocking seasons as, as we all have and you know most of the time you bobble around in autumn going oh it's all right they'll be okay and, and it, it catches up on you I'm not necessarily saying that will happen but um, on a, a percentage of worry that's a good way of gauging it isn't it yeah well in terms of relegation no no I wouldn't I wouldn't say I'm overly concerned at that but by the same token as DF alludes to there the longer this run goes on and of course you can't bury your head in the sand, can you? And I'm sure they're not. I'm sure Weber, you know Weber. He said it. It's not acceptable. They're not happy with what's going on at the minute. But him, Farker, and then players are the only ones really who can change this now. And as I said, I don't want to hear the head coach coming out and basically taking the referee to task or, or you know, making out it was just poor finishing or whatever or this, that, the other. It, it just they need to accept that they're in a hole at the minute and and come up with something come up with something you know if, if Farker is this innovative coach um, who's able to develop players then he sh- and he and he has done it as I say I mean if we hadn't seen what we'd seen after Millwall then you would be definitely concerned <laughs> because you would feel this guy's out of his depth but if he was able to change course after what was a, a terrible start then why aren't we seeing more of that at the minute it's just to me it's you know, stick those players back out on the park and hoping. I mean, he said himself, there's too much of the hoping or expecting something to happen. I want my players to go and force it. Well, I would say the same applies to that man as well. He needs to force the issue now, not expect something to change. Carl Layton, hello there, Carl. Uh, he's watching Kings Lynn today. Wants some goals. Hope uh, yeah. Simon Lappin's playing. 
I saw a few people saying, well, at least Norwich can't ruin my Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, they just did it on a Friday night instead. Um, and Carl Layton does want Simon Lappin back. Well, you know, let us know how he gets on at, at Lynn today if he's, uh, if he's playing. Uh, a couple more of them, because we've been on for quite a while already. Um, Mark Newstead asking about uh, what's going on with Nelson Oliveira. I think we touched on that. Uh, on. I, while Paddy was just talking there, it just came flooding back to me. At that horrible moment at the end of the first half when... They broke clean through. Harrison Reed won the ball. Oliveira, one defender. Wes clean, clean through on his right and decided to try and beat the man, which he did, but then put in an awful shot again. And Wes went absolutely spare. He was furious, wasn't he? And that carried on pretty much until the halftime break. I mean, that could have been 2-0. Well, yeah. Wes would have been on his left foot. And then, you know, if, if he'd have come away from there last night with a win, all of a sudden it's, everyone would think... Well, there is that bit of hope there, but that, that bit of hope there isn't at the moment. And, and to follow on what you were saying about Farker as well, I mean, I like the guy. I think he's a good um, representation or representative of the club. You know, he, the way he speaks is very enthusiastic, but the, the, the longer it goes on, the, the actions aren't backing up his words. It just begins to look more and more naive and the words of a very nice man who is out of his depth. And I hope that doesn't prove to be the case because I think a lot of people want him to be successful because they like that he is uh, the man in charge of Norwich City. But, you know, if it continues on at this rate, then he can't be enjoying the experience. I, I mean, they did they did play better than they have. It was by far and away nowhere near their worst away performance no, of the true, season. And they were playing a team that were unbeaten at home and second in the division and, and flying. And we all know what confidence does, just to throw that in there uh, Keith Baker I said over the last few seasons uh, yes when Alec Neal came in he changed the way the team played till we lost at Newcastle and then changed the style again and things went downhill it has stayed like that ever since even after changes in the club apart from one month of wins oh, September uh, and what else have we got here Josh Moy here we go let's end on this one shall we Josh Moy uh, all fans were happy to let this squad settle down and give them time to bed in and they've had that time Seven games ago, looked as though they had adjusted. Uh, now, complete other end of the scale. How much longer do we, the fans, give it? Well, you two, you two boys are as well as media professionals, Norwich fans. So maybe you can put your fan hats on. For me personally, as not as a Norwich fan, I would say, in my experience, that you have a very, very fair fan base, and they will give players time, managers time. Um, and they will, they, they will back them. There's so much latent goodwill there. I mean, Cara wrote, there's a lot of other stadiums, if they'd been served up, the, the rations had been served up over the last two months, those players and managers would have known about it long since. So I think, there, I think they have had time, and all they want in return is to see just some tangible signs of progress. A win here or there, you know, two, scoring two or three goals, looking far more resolute, looking like they're playing with energy and tempo. And, and aggressiveness if they're going to play a passing style play it with intent play it with a purpose um, they're not seeing anything there's no there's no encouragement on this seven game run it's just a regressive trend and that's why as, as we've discussed here today that the, the, the frustration is building and, and the pressure is building so really it's for me it's just how long has he got how long has the fans got before they turn completely depends on how soon before we see some positive signs and that isn't for me, going on another 10 game would be nice, another 10 game unbeaten run. It's just actually a few results and a few performances which show, ah, oh, right, I can see what they're trying to do here now. Because at the minute you can't see what they're trying to do. You're hearing a lot of sound bites about strategies and identity and culture, but you're not actually seeing anything tangible. And again, repeating myself, it's all about the results. That's why during that 10 game run, when they weren't playing well, but picking up results, everybody was fully on board because they thought that was base camp. And then after that, they would then embellish it with the entertaining football. It's actually gone the other way and, and it needs to turn pretty quickly. I completely agree. And, and the thing about August that always worried me was that it was getting progressively worse by each week. And you know, that's the, the difficult thing. You need the, the, the wins and points just to buy some time. Yeah, definitely agree with Pad's final point there as well. That I, I thought that was where they'd done the hard work and then they build from there. But they've regressed clearly. Um, I, all the talk about long term plans and stuff you this isn't an under 23s team this is a championship team who very recently spent four of five years in the premier league and had a lot of money yeah ed ed balls admitted they've wasted that they've made mistakes there's no point as going over that over and over again but 
they they haven't this summer just decided to become a development club that are there just to produce players to sell on to other clubs. They they need to realise that they're supposed to be in a battle and they won't have any choice soon because if it continues like this, it will become a relegation battle and that is, is unacceptable. I, I don't think they'll get relegated because I think there's at least three teams worse than them and they'll, they'll pick up enough results. But unless the penny drops and they really dig in and stop trying to play football which isn't suitable for the championship then I think it will get to the point like it did with Alex Neil last year where the fans start to make the decision for the board because they will just well if the crowds keep dropping at Carrow Road then that decision is going to be put on the board and unfortunately that's going to prove pretty costly again and I'm not you know with all the financial troubles that we've had made painfully clear in recent weeks I really don't know where that would leave the club going forward so it's in everyone's best interests if they can get out of it so I guess from this point on everyone's got to try and pull together back the team and 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 try and try and enjoy it to some extent but obviously if the team don't score goals and don't even look like they're going to win a game then there's only so far supporters can do that a fitting note to end what's already been a long weekend we're not even halfway through it uh, thanks all for watching really appreciate it pad dave thank you very much uh we'll be uh, it, well, well two of us will be in all week um building up to uh, sheffield wednesday when we do it all again and we'll see what we get at Carroll Road could be a very interesting afternoon that one uh, thanks for watching don't forget pinkin.com throughout the week with all the latest lines news and opinion and uh, we'll see you ahead of Carroll Road uh, cheerio